University and for several years taught theology at Westmont College in California. In 2003, he was appointed professor of theology and ethics at Acadia Divinity College. Unfortunately for us, Professor Wilson has yielded to the siren call, Go West, young man. And he and his wife, Marty, will be moving this summer to Vancouver, British Columbia, where Jonathan will begin service as Pioneer McDonald, professor of theology at Cary Theological College. And we wish you well as you, you travel west. Professor Wilson has authored a number of books, including Theology as Cultural Critique, The Achievement of Julian Hart, published by Mercer University Press and Studies in American Biblical Hermeneutics, Living Faithfully in a Fragmented World, published by Trinity Press International, Gospel Virtues, Practicing Faith, Hope, and Love in Uncertain Times, published by InterVarsity Press, God So Loved the World, A Christology for Disciples, published by Abingdon Press, and very recently, A Primer of Christian Doctrine, published by Erdman's. Professor Wilson is also one of the editors of Grace Upon Grace, Essays in Honor of Thomas, uh, A. Langford, published by Abingdon Press, and Professor Wilson presents to us the final paper of the day, entitled Canon and Theology, What is at Stake? Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate the go west young man, Bob. Our uh, daughter is visiting with us, and that's why I haven't been here for the whole day. But as she was sorting through some things uh, in our house, we were discovering that the color of my beard has changed over time. Uh, we're not entirely certain that young actually still applies to this beard, but I, I thank you for that. Um, I am uh, scheduled to conclude my paper in seven minutes from now. Uh, and so I am going to dispense with the, any preliminary marks that I had uh, planned to make. I'm also going to dispense with reference to uh, footnotes that uh, actually might clarify some of the things I'm going to say in my paper, uh, but I hope that it will still give you some uh, food for thought and uh, some things that we might discuss in the time that we have uh, when I conclude this. Uh, I, uh, I suppose being the last speaker at the end of a long day of intellectual effort is balanced by the fact that I get the last word. Uh, it's also the case that I'm a, I'm a theologian speaking here in the midst of a day that has been filled primarily with biblical scholarship. And as I reflected on that, I thought it might interest you to know that 20 years ago today, the graduate students in the program at Duke University received a memo from the Director of Graduate Studies. Uh, the graduate program at Duke is divided up into uh, four divisions, uh, biblical studies, uh, historical studies, theological studies, and religion and culture studies. Uh, the students in uh, all of those studies received a, a, a memo 20 years ago today announcing that beginning at that moment, every student who graduated with a PhD in religion from Duke University would be required to pass exams in Hebrew and Greek. A great panic set in uh, because no one noted that the memo was actually dated April 1st. Uh, <laughs> It, it was a tradition at Duke. Someone somewhere along the way had stolen a whole stack of letterhead from the director of graduate studies, and each year it, it fell upon the third-year students in the graduate program in religion to invent a new uh, memo. Uh, I, uh, I could tell you uh, some of the memos that came out and the one that precipitated the end of that practice, but... Uh, 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 but I will uh, save that for, uh, for perhaps coffee later on. Many years ago, a journal published back-to-back -back essays on biblical authority interpretation and interpretation by a theologian and a biblical scholar. The Bible scholar, who happened to be an evangelical New Testament scholar, began his article by noting that to move from the theologian's account of the authority and interpretation of the Bible to the real world of biblical scholarship was like moving into another universe. At the time I read this remark, I was struck by its perceptiveness. This New Testament scholar accurately describes a situation that many have worked to rectify in recent years. Both biblical scholars and theologians are working to overcome the dichotomy between their disciplines. This commitment does not mean that the work will be easy, but the situation has been recognized as a problem in several research projects, including at least two commentary series, are underway to address this problem. However, one area that I still find insufficiently and acknowledged and addressed by theologians is the notion of canon. If one moves from most theological accounts of the concept and function of canon to accounts of the historical formation of canon, one moves into another universe. 
from a kind of hermetically sealed purity of concept, one moves to a politically charged history. From a tidy antiseptic ideal, one moves to a messy reality. One could argue that it is a good thing, this difference between a theological account of canon and a historical account. While we cannot deny the messiness of politics and history, we also need an alternative, and that's what theology provides. So the argument goes, theology moves in the realm of conceptual clarity, while history and biblical scholarship moves in the realm of contingent events. Putting it this way, of course, reveals the mistake that I will argue. Uh, theology, and here in this essay I have in view Christian theology, betrays its subject when it prescends from history. Any Christian theology must be rooted in the history of Israel and the belief that Jesus of Nazareth is Israel's Messiah and Savior of the world. His identity and his work is historical. Any denial of history, formally or informally, is a denial of the Christ. Of course, this has not prevented Christians, particularly theologians, from making this mistake. This propensity to seek escape from historical and material contingency started almost at the beginning. This temptation will always be with us, but we must not succumb. So one thing at stake in canon and theology is the congruence of theology with its subject, that to which it must submit itself. But there's more at stake here. Because theology shapes and is shaped by its community, the way that theology understands its relationship to canon reveals something about the community to which theology responds or belongs. The question for theology then becomes, which community? Is theology responsive to the church? If so, which church? And what is the nature of theology's responsiveness? As guardian, as guide, as judge, as servant? Is theology responsive to academe? If so, then where do we locate theology within academe? Whose interests does theology serve? At stake then in the discussion of canon and theology are at least two issues that I will explore here. The nature of theology and its location in community. But of course the most basic question is the nature of canon. To this point, I have been writing and speaking of canon as if it were an obvious and unproblematic word with a clear denotation. But a closer examination reveals, as you have seen all day today, that canon is fraught with complexities. These complexities go beyond the simple list of books that varies among Christian traditions and even beyond the historical messiness of the formation of the canon. Indeed, the complexity extends beyond the canon to canonicity itself. And I'm skipping a couple of footnotes where I try to identify more clearly what I mean by the canon and canonicity. Uh, the canon is the, the list of books. Uh, however messy that list is, how many ever different kinds of lists we have, uh, that's, that's the list. Canonicity is uh, the, the quality that, that uh, a book has that causes it to belong. It's recognized in it uh, that puts it on that list. And those concepts are both complex as well. The complexity of canonicity itself can best be identified and described through an investigation of three notions of canonicity that John Howard Yoder labels high Protestant scholasticism, high Tridentine Catholicism, and high modernism. For the sake of clarity and brevity, I will typically shorten these to Protestant, Catholic, and modernist intending always to keep in mind the narrower historical reference of these labels to specific instances. These three do not come close to the exhausting the possibilities, and I will add a fourth, uh, what I will call late modernity or post-modernity, to provide us with different ways of the, that the church, that the traditions have understood, canon, community, and theology, in actual practice. What have we actually done with it? Once we've had investigated these and seen their shortcomings, I will propose an alternative account of canon, community, and theology. In high Protestant scholasticism, as in each of these, the notion of canonicity and the canon are so deeply intertwined that it is unproductive, I think, to try to untangle the line of dependency. That is, which comes first, the canon or canonicity? 
My concern instead will be the interdependency of these mature, high practices of each tradition. In the Protestant tradition, in its high scholastic expression, the canon is seen as the result of a historical process guided authoritatively and sovereignly by the Holy Spirit in the midst of power struggles that are shaped by political, ecclesiastical, cultural, social, and yes, even doctrinal commitments. Protestants confess the sovereignty of God in this process that led to the canon. In their controversy with the church in Rome, the Protestants separated this canon from the church and asserted its uniqueness as a body of literature. The canon is not dependent upon the church, but the church upon the canon. In this way, then, canonicity also becomes separate from the church and located in a body of literature, a set of books whose boundary is carefully identified. Thus, canonicity as authority becomes located textually. This served the Protestants well in their controversies with Rome. It also set up an understanding of theology that continues to mark the Protestant tradition today. If the canon is separated from the life of the church so as to be its foundation, and if authority is located textually, then theologians too become separated from the life of the church and are defined primarily, uh, I want to qualify that separated, but we'll go on, are, and are defined primarily by their relationship to the text rather than to the community. Certainly, the Protestant scholastics continued as faithful churchmen, but they did so as people primarily responsible to this text, the canon. This conviction may be seen in, the pra uh, in practice in the form that theology takes as an extraction of propositions from Scripture and the logical ordering of those propositions. The relationship between this high Protestant scholasticism and high Tridentine Catholicism is historically complex. Perhaps the best way to describe it is to recognize that what was established at the Council of Trent, that is high Tridentine Catholicism, adopts what is already present previously in Thomas Aquinas. But the Council of Trent, coming later, does so as a polemical response to the Protestant challenges, to the Protestant reformers. So you have the tradition of Thomas Aquinas, you have the Protestant reformers challenging that, and then you have the Council of Trent polemically responding to the Protestant reformers. So what you have in high Tridentine Catholicism is the retrieval of that earlier Thomistic tradition in response to the reformers' challenge. As we have seen with the Protestant tradition above, uh, these traditions, both the Protestant and the Tridentine Catholic, uh, Catholicism, arise in polemical situations, but they continue beyond those situations to shape the trajectory of theology in those traditions. So we can see Protestant scholasticism still today in the systematic theology of Wayne Grudem. We can see high Tridentine Catholicism still today in the work of various uh, Catholic theologians. Uh, uh, Cardinal Rotzinger would actually, now uh, Pope Benedict, would be uh, an example of someone who would primarily still represent uh, high Tridentine Catholicism with some uh, debatable areas. In high Tridentine Catholicism, the canon becomes clear, but it is also placed within the larger context of a canonicity that claims the canon for the church. Catholicism did this by means of its assertion that God provided two traditions for the guidance of the church, written and oral, roughly speaking. Uh, at any time in history, the church may, in submission to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, draw on the oral tradition as an authoritative guide. This is further developed in the magisterium of the church. Thus, for Catholicism, the work of theology is located not so much textually as institutionally. Theologians identify themselves, their work, and their responsibility in relation to the church's structures and interests. This produces a very different theological tradition from the Protestants. 
that could be ex illustrated extensively from Catholic works that follow in the wake of Trent. It is particularly evident in the resistance of Catholicism to modernity for a long time and in the one area of development for the Catholic tradition, moral theology, that theology that guides the practice of hearing confession. In other words, the resistance of, uh, trident of, of Catholicism flowing out of the Council of Trent to doctrinal development makes perfect sense given what the Council of Trent understood of the canon and canonicity. It also makes perfect sense of the fact that the one area that did develop in Catholic theology is the area of moral theology. In this polemical context between Protestant scholasticism and Tridentine Catholicism, clarity was a virtue and unclarity a vice. Without reducing the canon and canonicity in Catholicism and Protestantism to historical and political motivations, we can nevertheless see the attractiveness of what developed. For Protestants, the clear boundaries of the canon, the perspicuity of scripture, and the exegetical and theological method of Protestantism promises clarity, certainty, and authority for Protestant claims. For Catholicism, the teaching office of the church, her magisterium, with its access to the whole revelation of God in its unchanging tradition, guarantee, guarantees clarity, certainty, and authority for Catholic claims. In both cases, it is especially important to note that any uncertainty about the history of the formation and recognition of the canon disappears with the closing of the canon. Now, neither of these traditions, in the end, admits to real messiness or uncertainty in this history of the formation of the canon. Both see it under the providential guidance of the sovereign God. So in both the canon and in canonicity, these historical instances become traditions, that is, Protestantism and Catholicism, become traditions that prescind from the contingencies of historical and material situatedness. That which was historical has now moved into the world of timelessness and universality. This denial of our situatedness that we see in high Protestant scholasticism and high Tridentine Catholicism became no longer tenable to a large number of people as a result of a whole set of developments that we get under the term enlightenment and the rise of modernity. These developments gave rise among many Protestants to an erosion of confidence in the clarity, certainty, and credibility of the Protestant account of the canon and canonicity. An early 19th century foray of modernity into Catholicism was repulsed. The next significant invasion came in the later part, latter part of the 20th century and succeeded. So what happened early on in Catholicism, was, uh, in Protestantism, was resisted for uh, many uh, years, many decades uh, by Catholicism and only more recently has entered into the Catholic tradition. So this, this uh, early uh, high Protestant scholastic denial and high Tridentine Catholic, uh, Catholic denial of uh, the historicity and the situatedness and the messiness of the canon and canonicity, that, that early denial began among Protestants to disintegrate with the rise of modernity, with uh, archaeological finds, with literary studies, with uh, uh, discovery of, uh, uh, with lexical discoveries, all kinds of things that began to erode that confidence. The rise of modernity and the loss of confidence in that Protestant account is interwoven with the development of the high modern account of the canon and canonicity. This modern account seeks a replacement for the ground of canon and canonicity articulated by the high Protestant, schola uh, by high Protestant scholasticism. For modernist Protestants, this search took two different paths, roughly speaking, the rationalist and the romantic. So high Protestant scholasticism and confidence in that begins to erode. That is replaced by what we see arising in modernity. The rationalist account subjects the canon to standards of canonicity established by reason. 
This path is identified by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, quoting, the accidental truths of history can never become proof of the necessary truths of reason. The accidental truths are the content of the canon, that historically contingent account of historical events. Its content is canonical, has canonicity, only when it is made to conform to the necessary truths of reason. While Lessing identifies the rationalist path of modernity, It was uh, probably scheduled to expire at 4.15 when my paper was uh, scheduled to be done. Uh, the romantic path of the modernist account of canon and canonicity also follows from the loss of confidence in high Protestant scholasticism. Here, the romantics abandon claims about God's sovereignty in the historical process of the formation and recognition of the canon. They also, in the immediate aftermath, like the rationalists, of the devastating wars of religion, abandon any claim to the perspicuity of Scripture. If it's clear, why are we killing each other over our differences? Uh, uh, any, abandon any claim to the perspicuity of Scripture and the reliability of exegetical and theological method. In place of these, the Romantic modernists turn inward. This turn is brilliantly argued and asserted by Friedrich Daniel Ernst Schleiermacher in his own religion, speeches to its cultured despisers and in his The Christian Faith. Here, the canon becomes a record of earlier Christians' inner life that is subject to our experience of the inner life of faith today. Thus, the canon is subject to the canonicity of our contemporary experience of faith or absolute dependence, as Schleiermacher would have it. So in high modernity, the canon is explicitly subjected to the canonicity of reason or experience. In the rationalist turn, theology becomes the discipline of conforming the teaching of Christianity to human reason. Thus, theology locates itself within the context of some account of reason that is justified on grounds other than the Christian faith. The canon becomes the source of those ideas that must be conformed to the necessary truths of reason. In the romantic turn, theology becomes the discipline that investigates and explicates religious experience. In high modernity, that experience was seen as having a universal quality. Theology thematizes that experience and reflects it back to particular cultures in a way that demonstrates the core, universally true religious experience. For romantic modernity, the canon becomes a collection of various cultures' accounts of religious experience that conceal this universal religious experience. The task of theology is to peel away the layers of concealment to reveal that religious experience at the core. In high modernity, then, we see a new turn in the relationship between the canon, canonicity, and theology. In the Protestant tradition, high Protestant scholasticism, the canon is dehistoricized and the work of theology is timeless based on that text. In the Catholic tradition, the church is dehistoricized and the work of theology is timeless. In modernity, the canon and the church are historicized and humankind is dehistoricized either by an appeal to the necessary truths of reason or to universal religious experience. Since we have given up on the notion of a, of a, of a, a timeless truth in Scripture or a timeless deposit of truth in the church, we have to find that timeless deposit elsewhere in reason or in experience. Theology, then, in high modernity, becomes the mediator between a historical faith 
and a timeless human essence. In our final episode of this historical account, high modernity develops into late modernity. Here, everything becomes, histori everything becomes historicized and localized. We have lost confidence in the claim of high modernity to give an account of timeless human reason or universal religious experience. Indeed, we have become modernists, unbelievers in modernity, which is why accounts of late modernity are nearly indistinguishable from accounts of post-modernity. I'm still in favor of retaining the terms for uh, reasons that I go into here, uh, in part I'm going to skip. In late modernity, human reason becomes historicized and localized. The truths of reason are no longer necessary. Like historical events and identities, reason now is also accidental or contingent. Likewise, human experience is no longer universal. It is now local and contingent. Thus, various understandings of reason must be applied to the canon to produce a theology fit for that account of reason. And no claim can be made to universal validity for that theology. We all have our own. Similarly, various communities of experience read the canon to create various canonical accounts of theology. Thus, uh, my experience becomes the source of my theology. And you can trace this out in the fragmentation of theology uh, in all sorts of ways uh, that I won't go into because I can't explain uh, why it's both good and bad that that is happening. Uh, in late modernity, everything now moves in the realm of contingency and particularity. Nothing is necessary or universal. Everything can be and is otherwise. I'm going to skip a couple of things in order to move on to the constructive account that will take just a few pages to develop. A faithful and credible account of canon and theology begins and ends with the recognition of the historicality of the good news of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. It is not simply that this good news is communicated to historical reality or that it is accomplished in history. Rather, the historical redemption of creation is this good news. Protestantism and Catholicism treat this good news as historical up to the moment of canonization, then immediately move to theology and practices that are removed from history and from the continuing historicality of that redemption. Uh, high modernism acknowledges the continuing historicality of the canon, but it immediately moves to purge that historicality by means of ahistorical reason or universal experience. Late modernity recognizes the historicality of everything, but has no place for redemption in the contingencies of history. What is needed then is an account that thoroughly embraces our inescapable historical particularity and affirms the reality of redemption in that historical particularity. To make the point one more time, in the past, theology has treated God's work of redemption as historically particular up to the coming of Jesus and the texts that bear witness to that, after which time this work passes into a realm of timelessness no longer marked by the contingencies of history. In contrast to this, our understanding of the canon and of theology must arise from and be responsible to the recognition that what began in historical particularity continues in historical particularity. Apart from the conviction that the work of Jesus Christ continues today in history, we would be reduced to the late post-modern conviction that all we have is historical flux, meaning nothing. But grounded in the conviction that the kingdom of God that has come in Jesus Christ continues its work today in the flux of history, we have more than historical flux. We have historical redemption, not as past eras would have it, an escape from history. This recognition of the continuing work of redemption tells us that the canon, as a body of texts formed in history and bearing always the marks of that historical particularity, is precisely the body of text that we need as witness to that redemption. If we, if we uh, seek to remove the historicality of the canon, 
by means of a faulty doctrine of inspiration, ecclesiology, or anthropology, the Protestant, Catholic, and modernist moves, then we remove its power to participate in God's work in redemption and to bring us into that historical work of redemption. Of course, if that work of redemption does not continue today in historical particularity, then admitting the intractable historicality of the canon would also remove it and us from that work of redemption. If redemption is not historical, then a, a, a historical canon doesn't participate in that work. If the work of redemption is historical from beginning to end, then it must have some presence in history today. Here, the canon in all its ineradicable historicality is joined by the people of God in all their ineradicable historicality. It is a particular people located in space and time, or better, throughout space and time, that God's work of redemption continues. It is this people whose life is bound up with the canon as the community that participates in God's work of redemption. Here we encounter a problem that is profound, illuminating, and often deeply tragic. Who is this people of God? The history of redemption in which the canon participates and to which it bears witness is grounded, first of all, in the people of God called Israel. Most of us who are in the church are latecomers, the wild branch grafted in, Gentiles whose claim to participate in this redemption and to become canonical people depends upon God's faithfulness to Israel and upon our conviction that Jesus of Nazareth is the historical culmination of that work of redemption. For too long, theology has neglected the responsibility to engage in gracious, humble controversy with the people of God called Jews. Is this an issue really related to canon and theology? Absolutely. Up to this point, I have deliberately concealed the importance of recognizing that the deepest and most illuminating debate about the canon is whether the New Testament is canon for the people of God. That is, the most difficult canonical question is not the differences between the Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic canons, but the difference between the Jewish and Christian canon. Denying the historicality of the Christian canon has obscured and even concealed this critically important question. And we could develop how it, it has aided in the rise and, and the practice of, of anti-Semitism in the church, in our history. To recognize the historicality of the people of God is to recognize that uh, we must have a continuing relationship with uh, Israel as uh, the Jewish people. If we admit the historicality of both the canon and the community, then we must engage in this controversy until the Messiah comes or returns. But if we locate the canon and the community within the flux of history, what happens to canonicity? Of all the earlier, all of the earlier positions established canonicity by locating it in a timeless universal. And the one tradition that denies any timelessness or universality, late, post, modernity, also denies canonicity. Here we must retrieve the claim with which I began my account of this alternative understanding of canon, community, canonicity, and theology. All are located within the historicality of God's work of redemption for Christians in Christ. In shorthand, then, we may say that canonicity is located in the kingdom of God not in a text, not in the church, not in human reason, not in human experience, but in the kingdom of God. We believe that the kingdom has come, that it has come in Jesus as the Messiah, and that we are participants in that kingdom by faith in him. So the kingdom of God is canonical. But then, let the arguments begin. We must resist our desperate but misguided desire for timelessness and for certainty that we can control. Canonicity is not something that we can have. It is something to which we must submit. And how we are to do so is a matter for constant discernment. This account of canonicity is congruent with and may be extended by considering once again the canon. 
This collection of books is precisely that, a collection. These books are themselves part of the ebb and flow of history. They arose in the midst of controversy and argument, and we must not flatten that reality. Um, I'm going to skip a paragraph here that's probably going to cause problems for me. Uh, I mean, skipping is going to cause problems. Uh, but if the church is not canonical, neither is the canon. That is, the existence of the church tells us that the canon is not canonical. This body of text is itself received by a community, and it is within that community that the canon has life. So the canon and community are bound together in their participation in the kingdom of God. And canonicity is located neither in the canon nor in the community, but in that participation. That assertion, of course, does not settle any arguments. It simply tells us which arguments we should be having and how we are to engage in those arguments. But that is precisely what we should expect if we are caught up in the history of redemption. This leads us then finally to theology. What becomes of theology on this account of canon, community, and canonicity? That question requires an extensive answer that I can only point to here is best answered by the practice of theology, not by an account of the practice of theology. Nevertheless, something may be said even in this context. On this account of the historicality of the gospel, theology becomes a guide to the continuing arguments about the presence of the kingdom today. What does it look like? Where is it at work? How may we participate? How are we failing to participate? In this way, theology enters into the lively arguments of the community that forms it as a community and extends its understanding of the gospel of the kingdom. Theology is that office, role, or calling in the life of the church that has special responsibility for knowing, guarding, and making available to the community the rules that the community has developed over time for its life and thought. Theology must practice wisdom in this work. Not every rule, doctrine, is applicable in every circumstance. Sometimes a rule may be precisely the wrong rule to apply in a particular circumstance. Uh, examples uh, I will set aside for the moment. Sometimes a circumstance may require the retrie retrieval of a forgotten rule or the development of a new rule that develops out of the history of redemption. Some rules are so well developed that they require little argument today. These we may call dogmas. Uh, the church uh, asserts them not because they are timeless, but because we have worked through the arguments so thoroughly in history that uh, they're settled uh, for most in, in, in almost every instance. In all of this, the responsibility of the church is to engage in reading the canon and listen to one another in the community so as to discern the work of the kingdom today and participate in it. We have to get over our fear of the messiness of history and the ebb and flow of history uh, because we live in the midst of a history into which God has entered and, into which God, and in which God continues to be present. And that leads me to my final word. This essay is, in reality, an essay on the Holy Spirit. So I deliberately set myself the task of writing the paper without reference to the Holy Spirit. Now let me make that explicit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that extends redemption in the world today. It is the Holy Spirit who worked in history and guided the writing of Scripture and the formation of the canon. It is the Holy Spirit who called into being the church and gathered a people for God in Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who leads us today in discerning the kingdom and living in it. Why did I not make this explicit in the beginning? Because the Holy Spirit does this work in a way that grants us no special privilege or claim. The Spirit's work is concealed and revealed in our ordinary humanity and in our human history in the same way that God is concealed and revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. It is our calling to be faithful disciples of this Messiah who came to us in history and is himself the meaning and end of history. Let us walk in this way. Thank you.